Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresha Gunta, and I am Council and Education Director at the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. Thanks for joining us for today's installment of the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta's monthly webcast series. Today, I'm excited to have Robin Miller here with us to speak to us about how third-party fundraising protocols are essential for nonprofits. Robin is our Senior Corporate and Tax Counsel here at PBPA. Um, if you are a client of ours, you've probably worked with her in the past, and she's also presented several webcasts on great topics relevant to nonprofits. So we are always excited to have Robin speak to us in a webcast. Before Robin goes into the substance of today's topic, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about PBPA. Our mission is to provide free legal services to community-based nonprofits. We do this by connecting local nonprofits with attorneys from the leading law firms and corporations in the Atlanta area. The attorneys help nonprofits with their business law matters. If you are interested in applying to be a client, you can go to our website and fill out a request for legal assistance. Please keep in mind that our clients must be 501c3 organizations located or serving the greater metro Atlanta area, um, whose clients are low-income or disadvantaged individuals, and the nonprofit should otherwise be unable to afford legal services. Um, also on our website, available for free to any organization interested, are a wealth of resources. There you will find articles, past webcasts, and podcasts. Also, um, one day we hope to pick up our workshops in person too. And a quick disclaimer, today's information is just general information. It is not specific legal counsel. If you have questions relevant to your nonprofit and its specific situations, please reach out to Nicole. And the content of today's webcast is copyrighted by PBPA. And now, Robin, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Sarisha. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. I hope you all are doing well. Um, I um, am excited to be here this morning, but we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Sarisha Ganta, who just did our introduction. So thank you, Sarisha, as well as Randy Zelser, who is our client manager, who many of you know um, and work with. Um, so the two of them are the, the people that make this all happen. And so I'm, I'm just here to give you a little education. So I appreciate all that they do. Um, I hope everyone's having a wonderful morning. Um, my topic is third party fundraising. Um, you know, we're going to the as you can see by this agenda, we're going to discuss what what am I talking about? What is third party fundraising and what is this? Not, what is it not? Because it could include a lot of things. So I want to level set and help everyone understand what I'm referring to when I say that. We're also then going to talk about the risks associated with third party fundraising and then, of course, how to manage those risks. Um, so with some protocols and agreement, maybe an application um, to help make that work for your organization. See if I can move the screen. There we go. All right. So have you ever had an individual business or group? want to host a fundraiser or an event for you to raise funds for your nonprofit? The answer probably is yes, or you wouldn't be on this on this webcast. So I want that's the key question we're covering. And that's really the um, uh, what we're focused on. So a third party fundraiser for the purposes of this discussion is a non affiliated group or individual non affiliated to the nonprofit or individual who is an organizer of an event that's going to benefit that nonprofit. Um, but the nonprofit really has no fiduciary responsibilities and little or no staff involvement. The nonprofit is not putting on the event. This other non-affiliated group or individual or third party fundraiser, as we will be calling that person throughout this presentation, is conducting the activity. I want to give you some examples. So a couple decides to host um, a dinner event at their house and they, they um, you know, it requests a hundred dollar donation um for participation in this dinner the couple collects all the checks 
and then writes one check to the to a charity um, for all of the 10 couples that attend, amazing $1,000. The, they, they let the couples know, um, you know, that that's what they're doing, that it's for this charity and please come and we're gonna have this wonderful dinner. So that is one example of a third party fundraiser. Another might be a women's golf group um, that they, they get together, they golf regularly, and they decide they're going to host a little golf tournament and raise, or maybe not so little golf tournament and raise money for nonprofit or charity A. Um, again, that is a golf group not associated with the charity that's going to raise money for that charity. Um, a final example might be a DJ who decides to host a party and all of the entry to get into the party, all that money is going to go to charity A. Um, none of it is going to the DJ. It's, you know, a free event that the DJ decides to host. Um, and maybe some of that money is going to go to a second charity. So maybe he's dividing it up. So those are sort of three concrete examples of what we are thinking of as a third party fundraising raiser um, event for purposes of this discussion. We are not discussing today uh, Facebook charity fundraisers um, because that's a whole nother uh, ball of wax, frankly. And so we're not discussing that and we're not talking about cause marketing either. So or uh, co-venture arrangements, cause marketing, where the company is selling whatever it is they normally sell and a portion of those proceeds are going to the charity. So those two things are separate topics. Um, so we're setting those aside for today. All right, so now that we've level set and we know what we're talking about, let's talk about what are the risks? Because um, there are a number of them and, you know, not all of them are huge risks, but there are risks out there that, that you need to think about and make sure that you can address. So if a nonprofit's name is associated with a fundraiser, you know, it could appear to the public or the government that it's their event. So if they're doing the golf tournament and they say, you know, to be, raise money for Charity A, People might think Charity A is, is actually putting this event on, and they're, they're not. Um, also, there's many state and federal laws that, that nonprofits have to comply with. And so it's really important for those third-party fundraisers to be aware of those requirements because they still may apply. Um, and we'll talk into more detail about that. In addition, there's some fundraising activities that only nonprofits can participate in. And we'll get into the details of those a little further as well. So. Um, some other risks to be aware of is, you know, the third party fundraiser might inadvertently break a law or regulations or rules. And so helping them to understand what those rules are and to, to steer clear of those is important. A really good example of that is gambling and gaming events. Um, often nonprofits are the only ones that can engage in some limited gaming events and some gaming events are just outright illegal. Um, so, so we want to put some parameters or help our third party fundraisers understand that. Um, I should back up for a second because I have some clients who have said, you know, I just don't want to deal with third party fundraising. I don't, um, it's too much risk. It's too much of a hassle, but I have a lot of clients that say, gosh, if someone wants to raise money for me. Yeah, I'm so excited. That's great. We could use more money. Um, and there's lots of little groups out there doing that but we need to kind of manage that and make sure it's safe and works well with who we are and protects us. So that's really where we're focused now um, is those who want to do it and sort of identifying those risks and how we're going to solve them. All right, so going back to our list, another risk is that the organization's trademark or copyrighted materials might be used inappropriate. The name might be used for an improper use. Um, also, you know, if there's anything that goes wrong at that event, the nonprofit really doesn't want to be dragged into any kind of liability related um, uh, dispute or litigation. So those are that's another thing to be careful of. Um, and I know I'm kind of talking about all the risks, but don't worry, we've got some solutions. Just hang in there with me, just kind of trying to go through and understand what those things are. So. You know, an event may occur where the nonprofit isn't registered for charitable solicitation. So you have to be careful who is actually soliciting is the first question. The nonprofit may not need to be registered in that um, state for charitable solicitation, 
but they might need to be. And so we need to really look at the circumstances of that in, in every event. And so that's something to just keep in the back of your mind. Where is this event taking place? If it's in Georgia, you should already be registered in Georgia. If it's not, we've got to think through that issue. Um, you also need to think about, is this an event that you're proud of? They might be conducting some kind of event that you're just not really comfortable you want your name associated with. Um, and that's something to really consider and think about because your reputation is your most important asset um, to protect. Um, and so one of them. And so you definitely want to make sure that you're aligned with their objectives. You also want to make sure that this event doesn't conflict with your big event. Like, what if you're having a gala that weekend and they're going to do another event? You're like, wait a minute, that doesn't fit. So maybe you need to move that around or work through that. Um, donors um, may not be able to deduct donations depending on how it's structured for these kinds of third party events. And so you want to make sure they're structured properly. We'll get we'll talk more about that. Um, the nonprofit, you know, if somebody's giving money to you, whether it's directly or indirectly, you want to know who they are if it's indirectly. If it's directly, you'll know. But if it's indirect, you want to get that information so that you can reach back out to them and tell them more about what you're doing and really get them invested in, in all that you're up to and maybe giving more. Um, the other risk that often comes up is the risk that you may end up running this event, which is certainly something that you do not want to have happen. Y'all are busy enough, you have things going on, and um, it would take away from your mission and other work that you're doing. So you wanna make sure that there's a clear path for how they're gonna operate or, or pull off this event um, and with what resources. All right, so how do you manage these kinds of risks? Well, we recommend that you have a protocol in place. You know, here's here are the guidelines. Here's how we expect our um, third-party fundraisers to conduct these kinds of activities to ensure that everyone is safe and protected and that it comes off without any hitches. Um, we also recommend that there be an application process and an actual agreement that includes agreeing to abide by these kinds of protocols. So what would be included in these protocols? What are we generally trying to ad address? You can see that list there of all the different things, and we're going to go through those next so that you have a full and complete understanding of the types of protocols that will help your organization to have successful third party fundraising events. All right, so an event application. Put it on your website, third party fundraisers, protocols, application, let us know. Love to hear about it. We don't want to hear about it afterward. We want to know before. Of course, you need the name of the third party fundraiser, whether it's a, if it's a group of people, who are they, what, who's the contact person, um, obviously some more details, but you want a full fledged event description. The date of it, the start date, the end date, if it's more than one day, the time, location, what the event includes, all the different aspects of what the event includes. Um, how they plan to market this event. Um, how many attendees? What kind of revenue do they think they're going to generate? And including a proposed budget, because another thing that we're going to talk about later on is expenses um, and managing expenses versus revenue and making sure that the nonprofit isn't on the hook for those expenses. Um, if they're going to just contribute the net proceeds and if they're potentially other beneficiaries of the of the funds, maybe you're not the only charity that's a beneficiary of this event. Um, so making sure all of that is really clear. Also, the number of nonprofit, the nonprofits volunteers that are needed. Sometimes the, the third party fundraiser on a day of, of the event needs some additional help and we'll be requesting volunteers from you and you need to kind of figure out, can you make that happen? And what would, how would that impact your mission? Finally, targeting donors, who are they targeting? And we're going to go through a lot of these different topics in more detail. And I keep saying that, but. Um, to delve deeper into these issues so that you can really think through how to manage them and what the issues are. So they submit this application to you and then you review it and decide whether or not you're going to approve it. Um, you know, you may need to change those dates and times and see if you can negotiate that. Um, you want to make sure that this event is going to complement um, your mission and your image. 
Um, and that, you know, if it isn't just don't do it, tell you, you're really sorry, but you're not, you're unable to, to do that. Um, I've had clients that have had to kind of refuse funds that were raised for them because it was from a group that just, they did not feel fit their mission enough to be associated with it. Um, that was a really hard decision, but they didn't want bad publicity either that could tarnish their image. Um, there have been times where a nonprofit may have to withdraw from approving an event. Um, you know, if it turns out that there's a scandal involving the fundraiser that's doing this, raising this money, um, then um, it may, may not be appropriate to be connected to that fundraiser. All right, so now let's turn to the very specifics of what was on that list. I see Sarisha. Hey, Robin. I have a question that was submitted um, like with pre-registration from someone. And so you're going through what happens when you review the application. Um, what happens when a third party never applied? What if they're using the nonprofit's name and they're saying that they're running this fundraiser for you and you just kind of find out through word of mouth? Well, that happens a lot. And that's why you want to really advertise these, this third party fundraising option and say that no one should be doing it without completing these applications. These sorts of things are going to happen, but the more that you get out into the public and advertise that you have this process, that it's expected that you follow it, um, that's really the best thing that you can do using social media, using your website, really letting your, your networks know that if somebody wants to raise funds for you, there's a process and that you'd love to have them do that, but there is a process. If somebody's out there raising money on your behalf and you know nothing about it and you really don't approve of it, then you need to send a cease and desist letter. And frankly, that's where you can get the attorney general involved. And in certain situations, I mean, we had a situation where um, the Atlanta Police Department knocked on somebody's door because they were pretending to be the the nonprofit and supposedly raising funds for them, taking the money and keeping it. Um, so it can go to different levels. That's where you reach out to PBPA and we kind of help you through what's the best next step and get some attorneys to help you in those circumstances. Um, so this is sort of the, the way to hopefully avoid those situations, um, but you can't necessarily protect from all of it. Um, and the more that you can put it on your website, let people know, encourage this activity in this way, then, um, then hopefully your networks will know and use this process. And then those that aren't using this process, um, you know, you, you'll probably have a better sense that, that maybe they're ones that, that you need to get shut down quickly. Um, Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or should I move on? Um, not right now. Okay, thanks. Um, but that is a tough one. All right, so requesting donations. So if the third party fundraiser is targeting specific donors, you really want to know who they're planning to target because it may be that they're some of your major donors and you don't want that second or repeated ask um, without you kind of managing and finessing that. Um, so you got to be really careful about that too. So you want to learn from that third party fundraiser. Well, how are you going to raise this money? Where is it coming from? Are you going to have sponsors? Are you going to have major targeted donors and who are they? Um, so that you can protect your relationships you already have um, and not upset any of your of your big donors. Um, another another important topic is gaming events. Georgia law is really strict about raffles and gaming events, even for charitable purposes. We have lots of articles and other webcasts that go into all these gaming activities. So a third party fundraiser should not be allowed to, and as part of your protocols, should say that they cannot organize any event that includes lotteries, gambling, fortune telling. I know fortune telling, but true, um, unless it's free. Um, raffles and drawings. And it's assumed that these are all fundraising activities. So there's money involved. Um, so you don't want them doing any of those activities because as it is, as a nonprofit, you can do a little bit of that, but you can't even do most of that. Um, so um, you can obtain a license to do a raffle um, as a nonprofit, but you're not conducting the activities this third party fundraiser is. And so they really can't do those things. And that should be something that you need to explain and make clear is unless we're doing the activity, which is not the point here, um, 
and, and we're not going to be responsible, then um, they, they shouldn't be participating in those activities as part of these events. All right, let's talk for a few minutes about marketing and promotion, because this is one of the biggest issues, right, is that they're using your name and marketing and raising funds on your behalf. And that crosses over a variety of different areas that we're going to cover. Um, so it's really important to have that written agreement. Not only are they submitting an application and you're giving them the protocols, but you're going to have an agreement that includes that they're going to abide by these protocols. Um, and the agreement, you know, you want it to be friendly. You want it to be um, cohesive and something that everyone's excited to get behind, but you definitely need to have an agreement so that you're protecting your organization when you're participating there, when others are conducting these events on your behalf. So one of the key things that when they're marketing or promoting their events, the third party fundraiser, is that it shouldn't say that you're sponsoring, the nonprofit is sponsoring or organizing the event, because you're not. Um, you should only be reflected as a beneficiary of the event. Um, you also want to make sure that they're maintaining the standards that you would want to see for your organization um, in, in promoting, producing, and conducting the event. Um, they may not run the event exactly like you do, but you certainly want it to have a feel that makes you comfortable, and that's important. Some additional fundraising and marketing. Um, I see that there's a question, does this include auctions? And I want to go back to that before moving forward. Auctions are not gaming. Auctions are a sales, it's a marketplace where you're selling goods and services. Um, so people are buying goods and services at an auction. So that's not um something that you would need to um worry about from from a gaming perspective um somebody also asked if we have a, a template for a third party agreement we do not give out samples um that we work with our volunteer attorneys who can work with you to develop a really good appropriate fundraising agreement that you could use going forward with your potential third party fundraisers um so now getting back to marketing and promotion. Um, you should um, make sure that the third party fundraiser knows how to reference your organization. What names you like to put out there? Do you have sort of a DBA that you like to use? Do you have certain logos that you want to use? Do you have certain programming that you want to promote? And so you need to work with them to help them understand how you should be referenced in their promotional materials for the event. Um, you also want to make sure that they're using your marks properly. You don't want them to put a different color on your logo. Um, you don't want them to stretch it out in a funky way. Um, you want to make sure that the wording matches with how you present your marks. And when I say marks, what do I mean by that? Well, marks can include your name, your logo, trademarks, um, written materials and photos, essentially all of your IP. Now, you're, not everything has to be officially filed and trademarked. You still have rights in your logo you still have rights in your name and so even if it hasn't received a circle r because it's been registered with the federal as a federal trademark you still have rights in those and um, they are still your property so a function of that agreement with the third party fundraiser is to create a license for that third party fundraiser to use your marks because you want to protect those you want to make sure that you're not giving what's called sort of naked licensing where anybody can use your name and logo um, or your other other uh, intellectual property. And so we're going to license that to them as part of this agreement. And um, the um, license will be revocable, meaning you can take it back non-exclusive, which means you can give it to others. So you may have multiple third party fundraisers planning events for you throughout the year. And it's non-assignable, which means they can't let someone else use it. They can't give it to someone else to use. Only they can use it. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what it means to license the use of your marks. So of course you wanna make sure they're not gonna use your marks in a way that's gonna diminish their value um, or be injurious to them. Um, you may even want to approve all of the things that they're gonna present. So if they've got a whole marketing campaign for this, or they're gonna put out a series of social media, you might wanna have the right to approve those um, to make sure, um, and, and anything that they do using your, your marks from 
beforehand till shortly after the event because they're going to talk up after the event how the event went. Um, and so now that'll depend, and we'll talk about this a little more, on how well you know your third party fundraiser. Um, you can terminate the license at any time. And I talked about this a few minutes ago. If if there's a scandal with the person that's that's putting on this event for you and you just are like, yeah, we can't be associated with this person anymore, you want to be able to do that. And that's all would be included in that kind of an agreement. Um, again, some of these things we've already talked about, we don't want them to alter your marks. You don't want them to let someone else use them. Another key factor is telemarketing and door-to-door -door solicitations. There's tons of rules out there um, and laws on telemarketing and door-to-door -door solicitations, both at the state level and the federal level. You don't want them to use your marks doing any of that without knowing the laws and complying with them. Most of our clients don't do that kind of work. Um, so to have someone else, a third party fundraiser doing that is jumping that nonprofit into a whole nother arena. If you do do that work, then that might be something that you could consider. But most of the time, our clients don't do that. Um, you also want to make sure that the marks aren't being used in a way that's contrary to your mission. Um, you know, depending on what you do and how, what you're talking about and what your uh, delivery of information is, it may not be appropriate for them to use it in, opposite, in an opposite way, obviously. So I, I said before, you want to make sure that they're submitting a proof uh, for approval before they distribute any of the materials with your marks on it. However, I, I have to qualify that. Sometimes we have clients who work with third party fundraisers. It's a group and maybe year after year, they're doing the same baseball tournament for you and raising money for you. Well, you know them now, you know, you have an agreement, you understand how they're going to use it. You know that they're going to do it in a certain way and, and you've had success. In that case, you might not need to review everything, right? You might just need to have that meeting of the minds, talk it through, make sure everyone's on board and then just let them do that. If it's someone you've never worked with before, you want to make sure that you see what they're putting out there before it goes out there. You want to make sure just that, you know, that what they're doing meets your, like, how you would present yourself from a grammar perspective even. So really think through that they're putting your name out there and sort of acting a little bit as your representative, but they're really not. Um, and, and making sure you're managing that to protect yourself. All right. That's all I'm going to say about marketing and promotion. Um, I, I talked a lot about that. And now we're going to turn to the deductibility of donations, because this is kind of critical for, um, for, for everybody. So as you all know, a donation must be given directly to a 501c3 organization in order for it to be potentially deductible to the, for the donor. So in my example, if I go to that couple's dinner party and I write a check to Susie and Joe Smith. Um, I can't take a deduction for that because I've given it to Susie and Joe Smith. And then Susie and Joe Smith are aggregating that and writing one check to Charity A. Well, I, I, I don't get a deduction if I could take one. So it's important for all of the money to go to the nonprofit if there's an expectation that those donors are going to get a tech, be able to deduct that donation. Um, so that's an important part of the process. And then that will affect how you set it up will affect your ability to manage expenses and address expenses, um, income and expenses overall, and what the process will look like. Um, and, and somebody asked a really good question, Allie did. Do Susie and Joe Smith get to take the deduction? Do we send them a letter for the entire amount? If you, if you just get a donation from Susie and Joe Smith because you know nothing about this and they suddenly send you a check, you're gonna send them that, that receipt, which is inappropriate. They should not be submitting that with their taxes because it wasn't their money. Um, but because um, they told people what it was being used for. Um, so they, they shouldn't be taking that deduction. But if you didn't know, then you would give them a receipt. But if you know, 
you shouldn't be giving them a receipt for the, all of that. You should be asking them for a list of the donors who gave. You can't give them a donation receipt, but you can certainly send them a thank you note um, because they didn't give the money to you. Um, and that's why it's so important to kind of educate Susie and Joe Smith to say, hey, you know, next time, um, you know, let's let's set this up where the donations come in directly to us so that we can give them donation receipts. And also it allows you by having their names to be able to um, ask for more donations in the future and send them your newsletter and help them understand more about your mission and what you're doing. Um, all right. So that leads us right into this managing event and income expenses. A couple basic rules. A third party fundraiser may not open bank accounts in the name of the nonprofit. That's unless they're an actual agent of the organization, which you are not making them through this process, they should not be able to open up bank accounts. And if they do, that's fraudulent. Um, so they're not going to have their own account. Now, they may have their own bank account for their own purposes, um, but it won't be in the name of the nonprofit. And that's fine if they have their own bank accounts for their own purposes. And they want to, if they say, look, we don't want to raise, we don't want the money to go through you. We know that, um, you know, most of the money that's coming in is through a silent auction. It's not going to be deductible to the people buying the items. So, you know, we're just going to collect all the money, deal with the expenses and submit it to you. Um, and, and that may be the way that works out and that might be fine. But if people are giving money with the ex expectation that they're donating, then that would not be the best way to go. Um, the, in the application, you should have them submit a budget, a proposed budget. And um, in your agreement, you wanna make sure they're gonna follow that budget. And to the extent there are any changes that need to be made that that they're approved in writing by both parties. So that, you know, you hate to have someone run an event that costs $25,000 and they only make five. And the total income coming in is $30,000. That's it's a lot of effort for a small amount of money um, and a lot of expense for a small amount of money. You really want it to be the reverse, right? You want the expenses to be about 25% and the income to be 75% that's going to the charity or the revenue going to the charity. Um, so you wanna make sure that they're, they're following their budget. Um, and then also you wanna make sure that the expenses that are incurred are the sole responsibility of the third party fundraiser. The charity should not be signing any contracts for locations the charity should not be responsible in any way because then it becomes your event um, for any of the obligations. So here's how you manage this. And somebody asked a really good question. So there's sort of two options here, right? Um, if all the event proceeds are going directly to the nonprofit, then what you do is the third party fundraiser submits reasonable expenses for reimbursement, but it's gotta be per the budget. So you've already negotiated what those expenses are. So the event proceeds come in and then you can pay for the expenses. If there's no proceeds, they're on the hook to pay those expenses. You're not reimbursing them. So it's up to them to manage that. If the third party fundraiser receives the proceeds, then the expenses come out from that. Um, just like I mentioned in that silent auction circumstance, they need to maintain, though, um, all the receipts and an accounting of both the income and expenses and provide a copy of that to the nonprofit so that the nonprofit understands all of the income and expenses associated with it. You also want them to give you that list of donors so that um, even though you can't give them a donation receipt, you still want to thank them and then share more about who you are and what you do with them. Um, lastly, on managing event income and expenses, um, you want to make sure that all the net proceeds from the event um, that the nonprofit is entitled to through the agreement are received within 30 days. You don't want this to drag out. Um, we had somebody who had an event and they claimed that they were robbed a week after and so that all the money was taken. So, you know, you just, that was a long time ago, but that did come up. Um, so you want to make sure that in your agreement that it says, look, 30 days, it's all settled up, everything is completed. Um, 
and um, including an itemization supporting any documentation for expenses in excess of $200. Um, you could even, um, you know, get all the expenses. I mean, depending on the size of the event and what's going on, but certainly you want that written accounting um, that includes anything over $200 in expenses. All right, now let's briefly talk about indemnification and liability, because this is kind of really the last final topic that you want to talk about in your protocols and definitely have in your agreement. If you're not conducting this activity, if it's not your activity, you should not assume any legal or financial liability associated with it. And you want to make sure there's an indemnity provision where they're indemnifying you um, uh, or any party involved in the event, any aspect of, of what's part of you um, for any liability or damage arising out of the event. All right, so this, this next slide is kind of a good paragraph of language that you might see in an agreement um, that they're gonna indemnify, defend, and hold you harmless, including all of your folks um, from and against any liability damage, expense, or other costs arising out of the event. Finally, um, you should make sure that your third party fundraiser is obtaining appropriate insurance and include that in the potentially in the application and definitely in the agreement. Um, you know, if they're they're hosting this big party, the DJ is hosting this big huge party, and maybe it's outside you know, you want to make sure that they've got their own event insurance because it's not your event and you should never take out event insurance or um, sign the permit to get the spot and the location if it's not your event because you are liable. You get that permit, your name is on it, you're you're potentially liable. Um, so, so be careful with that. Um, and you want them to show you the proof of that insurance to make sure that they really got it. All right, so, so a few small additional tips. A couple of them are really um, uh, reminders of what we've already been talking about. Wanna make sure you're complying with all the laws um, in the planning and promotion of the event um, and as well as IRS regulations. Um, you wanna make sure that the third party fundraiser is not in any way saying that they're agents of yours um, or that this relationship is creating some kind of partnership, joint venture, or literal physical connection to you so that you become liable and that becomes your event. Yes, I love that idea. Should you be asked to be included as an additional insured? Yes, that's a great idea. I would recommend that. Um, even though it's not your event, um, you're the beneficiary. Um, you know, uh, somebody asked about size of the event. I think you handle the couple that's having 10 couples over for dinner a little differently than you handle a DJ having a party for a thousand people, right? Um, but you still have the same kind of application and it's just gonna have less on it. And the agreement is gonna still have a certain amount of information of like particularly about licensing your marks if needed. Um, but can be a lot more streamlined. So I think there are sort of different levels, but the protocols are still the same. You don't want them having door prizes at the dinner um, or a raffle at the dinner. Because again, that's still illegal gambling. And now they're doing it, um, which makes it clearly illegal gambling. It's not even being done by the nonprofit where they might have a license. So I do think there's you know some tempering depending on how big an event it is, but having this out there on your website saying, hey, we'd love to work with you. Here's our here's our protocols. We have a process. Please apply and we'll talk about it um, is kind of the, the goal that you want to and the tone you probably want to set. Um, another question, if we're included as additional insured, Um, no, so when people are giving donations, you're not going to take in money for the door, like for tickets and things like that. That's because if they're buying a ticket, it's not a donation, right? Um, most likely, most of that won't be deductible. So in that case, you want to cleanly separate that. But if somebody is literally just 
like having the dinner party, instead of them writing the check to Susie um, and, and Joe, you want to have them write it to Charity A. Um, it depends on how it's structured and how you want to take in the money. But it's all going to be very clearly stated that it is not your event um, and that you are just the beneficiary. And that's what you need to do. There's always a risk of liability, and that's why they need to indemnify you in the agreement. Any other questions? Sarisha? Okay. Um, most of the questions, other questions that we had around um, were around liability and questions around, and which I think you covered. But one question I just want to see if we could clarify, um, and you mentioned this primarily when you're talking about the need to have an application and the need to have an agreement is, what about concerns when an organization doesn't, or you feel like an organization didn't fully disclose the accounting or kind of the, the funds raised or, um, or the timeline, the money, the donations don't come to you um, in a timely fashion? Yeah, advice? that's a hard one. And part of that is really trust. Um, and there's gonna be times where you learn your lesson, right? But that's part of where you really wanna get that application and to your point, Sarisha, of really understanding who these people are doing some, some due diligence and vetting and making sure that you can trust to the extent possible these people. There'll always be something that goes wrong, right? Like you can't protect from everything, but the more that you can know who these folks are and get a real feeling for trusting them, the better. Um, I find that when you have, we've had clients that they've had these random sort of semi-celebrities come to them to say, oh, we're gonna do this big event and raise all this money for you. That's where you kind of have to put your antennas up and go, wait a minute. Why did they pick us? Who are they? How do I know that I can really trust them? Um, and are they really doing this for their own publicity, right? So that's an example. And so in that case, you might just choose to say, you know, I'm sorry, I think we're gonna pass, right? I think you have to do some due diligence to get to that point where you feel confident um, that you can, you can trust that they're gonna really do what they're saying they're gonna do. There's gonna be times where people don't, and then there may be situations where you can go after them to try and get the money. Um, as we talked about a little earlier. But there's this never is risk-free. And that's why some of my clients have said, I'm not doing this. No one's allowed to raise money for us um, unless we are involved and it's our event. So I think it's a question of risk tolerance and where you fall on that spectrum. Um, it, it, somebody asked a question, if a board member hosts a fundraising dinner, that's not a third party, correct? No, that's not a third party. That's the organization. If they're doing it as a board member on behalf of the organization, it is the organization and they're liable. Um, we, we don't have draft sort of templates. Um, what we do is we work with our, with our clients to develop protocols that work for them. Some clients have a, a lower risk tolerance than others, and they may put more parameters around. They may limit them in certain ways. And so we really help to try and develop what's gonna work for our clients, what kind of application um, protocols and agreement that they need. Um, and there may even be two different versions of that agreement, right? Like one that's a shorter, smaller, for smaller events, and one that's for bigger, larger events um, or different ways of, of handling things. Anything else? If there are um, any questions, any further questions, feel free to type them in the chat. But um, we covered everything that was asked in the pre-registration, Robin. Great. All right. Well, if you have further questions, please reach out to your Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta attorney, um, or you can find some other resources on our website. And I hope you found this helpful today. Thank you, Sarisha, so much. Thank you, Robin. I did have one more question. Ali um, mentioned one that she that was further up in the chat, so I missed it. Um, I think you covered this, but just to review, if there, if a nonprofit is hosting an event where we are asking our participants to raise funds, how much of this will constitute third-party fundraising? Depends on how that's being structured. Um, that's that could go a million different ways. But if it, you're asking your volunteers to go out and raise money for you, 
and you're controlling it and you're managing it, then it's your event. Um, and all these folks are now your solicitors. Um, if they're volunteers, that's fine. You know, um, if they're, you're paying them, you've got a whole nother set of circumstances. We will actually have a podcast coming out on that shortly. Quick plug in. That's right. I'm pay I'm professional fundraisers, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so Ali, to answer your question, we'll be having an another resource on that when that will cover those paid professionals and paid solicitors. But if you're if that's your fundraising event, you need to manage mm -hmm. that and decide how you do it, what your rules are, what your expectations are of these individuals who are going out and fundraising for you and under what circumstances. And you need to make sure you're registered for charitable solicitation in any of those locations um, beyond the state of Georgia where they're soliciting for you um, because they're acting as your agents. And so you're liable for anything and everything they do. Um, so you need to really carefully craft that and make sure everyone's on message and you know what they're doing and how. Okay, well, once again, Robin, thank you so much for this presentation and for this very helpful information. And to um, our audience who has joined in today, um, thank you so much for logging in. We hope you found this information to be helpful. And um, thank you for all the great work that you continue to do in the community. Absolutely. Thanks.